I'm Kurilana. Uh, some of you may know me as Ketalasi on Instagram or from my work. Most of, mo mostly I'm known uh, for fluid design. Um, I've been in fluid design and creating uh, fluid simulations and um, making a twist out of it, something new all the time for over a decade with uh, RealFlow. And uh, a few years ago, I was sitting in Houdini Hive in, in London, I remember, and I thought, finally, I need to put myself into the corner and, and transfer my knowledge into Houdini. And it took me a long time, actually, to uh, have the courage to do that. And uh, there are some myths about it that you have to know code or it's difficult, but it's not that difficult unless you make it complicated. Uh, obviously, you have like a completely infinite possibilities with Houdini and that's what makes me excited to finally do that, do the flip simulations in Houdini. So today I'm going to talk uh, about um, the very simplified version of how I did um, flip simulations and I did take my knowledge that I have about fluid simulations in general and transferred that in Houdini because Houdini has uh, all physically based uh, solvers and it works like surface tension, for example, that I'm going to talk about works straight out of that. So basically I'm going to give you the very steady ground if you ever want to try flip or you already did it but you just fell away or you're new to Houdini uh, I really want to encourage to do that. So first and foremost, um, I'm gonna show you a, a short reel of my little, little reel. It's just a thing of beauty. So, thank you very much. So when you look at these visuals, uh, first and foremost, when you go, in, go into fluid simulations, what you need to think of, how are they related? And whatever, whatever you actually choose to do in Houdini, I would encourage you to investigate what you like about uh, the, the specific area. Let's say it would be like grain simulations or something else. And, uh, what are the production level works that you see out there? What, how are they related? So with these visuals, as you can see, there are a couple of major things that you must master. And, uh, that's, um, that's what I'm going to talk about. And one of those things is scale. So when you work with fluid simulations, um, if you get the wrong scale, you might have an ocean worth of fluid inside a cup and try to splash it out and make uh, a small scale splash like you would have in photo shooting of slow motion and you would fail um, because it's it's extremely sensitive uh, to scale and um, so the first thing that I did when I went to Houdini is finding um, the right scale for small scale simulations so for that I figured out that from one and a half to three units of the grid that's pretty much enough uh, to have a perfect production level uh, splash or any simulation. So whether it's emitter or any object that you emit from or an object that you have a container of, of fluid and you splash it out. Um, so basically that's what I would suggest you to try and start working from. And you could go up and down a little bit and see how it looks then. Um, so another thing is substeps. So Working with the sub substeps is extremely important to make a workflow faster and better and simulation more stable. So if you just bump up the substeps, it could be very slow simulation in general, uh, simulation time. So what you could do, uh, and that's really efficient to do, is time scale. You go down with time scale, so make it slower. And uh, then you could add uh, substeps gradually, very slowly. And basically when you have the simulation slower, 
uh, all the step steps, you have more step steps per frame. So basically, it's more stable, uh, and you have just a little bit more time of simulation, but not as much as you would have just bumping up the step steps. And later on, you have a longer simulation, longer frames that you could simply retime uh, either the particles itself or the or the mesh, depending on what you need the output for with just simple retime node. And that's uh, pretty much um, the, the best way to go around it the, that I found. The second one is set extension. Um, back in the day when I was just starting out with fluid simulations and looking basically only on real life shooting, um, I figured out that obviously what, what sells the shot and what sells the beauty of the splash and uh, overall um, is that thick edge um, at the end of, uh, of the body of the fluid and also the droplets and those tendrils, which we're going to talk in a moment. And, um, oh, <laughs> that's good. Um, so, uh, so the first uh, and foremost thing was scale, and second one was to find how to make the step extension work. And to be very honest, uh, why I moved to Houdini uh, was one of the main reasons that step extension works right out of the bat. You don't have to code it, it just works well, like in real life. All you need to do, if it's not working for you yet, is make sure that scale is right, um, because it is very sensitive to scale. And resolution, you have enough of resolution for that. If you don't have enough resolution, it could just make a one big blob, because basically what surface tension does, it takes the particles and tries to glue it together and make the shape um, like in real life it would do. So for for the units that I told you about the scale, uh, the kind of a middle middle golden spot would be 0.03 or something around it. Uh, so it's quite quite small value of surface tension itself, uh, but it works as you can see these examples. It's exactly with the setup that I had. Um, and also velocity transfer, um, I would suggest to use Swirly because it works better for, for splashes, for example. So keep in mind that those two are extremely related and don't be scared if you have like, um, like, more like a blob rather than a form, just add more resolution. And uh, what I suggest is to use less particles, like let's say if you have like body of fluid, just minimize um, the, the body, the container itself, uh, so you can have like quicker results to see if surface extension is working and resolution is working. So as you can see, this is a great example of what surface, surface tension does in general. It rounds and rounds things up, uh, up. So you see those droplets, and that's a very desirable thing to have. And there's like very little fluid that we have over there, and good scale. And the, um, another thing that's really important, obviously, is meshing. So meshing for those who are very new to 3D in general, as well as just uh, adding polygons on top of particles uh, making a body of um, of the polygon. So basically you have an object that you could render out later on um, and um, that's pretty much it. So the, the goal for any meshing is to have uh, it as close to particle surface as possible. So you have it ideal and have all the detail out. So if, you, if uh, your mesh is uh, way, way too far, like uh, not not have enough resolution, it could basically, um, you could lose the detail that you have inside simulation. On the other hand, um, if your simulation isn't stable, uh, if it's flickering, you might not see the flicker, like um, the flicker itself uh, in the simulation un until you mesh it out. So, uh, so make sure, just in case, to bump up a little bit of a step step so it's not flickering because you will not be able to fix it inside the mesh itself. It has to be a good simulation to do that. Um, another, um, another thing of flickering that might happen is uh, that you don't have enough resolution for, for the mesh itself. And a uh, go good rule of thumb is uh, when you do the meshing, basically, as you can see on, on, on the right, is uh, the little tree for the meshing that I use myself. And uh, so basically you, you get VDB from particles, then smooth it out, and then get back to, convert it back to VDB. And it's pretty much straightforward. What you need to make sure is that uh, particle separation of your um, simulation self is close to voxel size. So it doesn't have to be exact, but it's close to voxel size, and that's, what, that's how you get the exact, um, 
uh, exact thing. And uh, the last note is uh, you have to make sure to do your best to find the golden middle of resolution. And what that means is to have as few polygons as possible, so as low resolution as possible, to still get the best results out of uh, your simulation. So when it's done right, so for example, this splash, as you can see these wrinkles over here, these are because of, of good meshing. It's very close to the particles and those wrinkles are made out of, the splash was splashed out with an object. So once you have uh, interaction between the object and the particle, the first particles who, which touches the surface uh, of the object are sort of like glued a little bit um, to the, for a short period of time uh, to, to the object and the top, top particles basically uh, go around it and that's how we have those wrinkles and it's very desirable in production uh, overall. And I didn't mention, but I mostly work with commercials um, in general. So sometimes uh, art projects like Coachella. Thank you. So that's, that's the example of um, perfect uh, meshing and simulation where you both have uh, the, the scale right, um, the thickness of, of the edge, as you can see all, all, all over there, and there's no flickering happening. Um, so that's, that's the goal for every simulation that you do. Uh, and then we go to the details. So when you work on, on any simulation, um, whether you want to work on only simulation or the final look, um, I would suggest you obviously to work on, on design itself. Um, think, think about the details because that, that what sells the shot the best. And, uh, uh, with Houdini, it's very easy to take out any information from your simulation and use it later on. That's one of the things that I really love. You don't have to, again, to think of, of coding or anything. So basically you have a simulation and you can just use simple group export to export random particles that you want throughout the whole sequence and then instance it uh, with the bubbles. So it's spheres, for example, randomized it as well with Wrangle. And um, um, you could, uh, one little look development note, <laughs> uh, you, could, you could use sometimes instead of a transparent shader that you have on the main body of fluid, you could just use silver or something like that. It sometimes works because it is, sometimes you have like super small bubbles and it speeds up the process. Uh, I work on Redshift, by the way. Um, really, really love that too. And um, the, the final, uh, but not the least important uh, desired thing inside simulations is tendrils. So those uh, long lines with the end, like teardrop uh, ending is all, always uh, was uh, very desirable and wasn't easy back in the day to do. And uh, with Houdini, um, that's something that I was focusing for uh, and on how to have the most control and how to actually have to the fully controlled tendrils itself. So for that, um, I, I found that there's a way to sculpt velocities and I was searching for it. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about that, but, um, but basically you can have full control on where all those tendrils go. And, um, and the, the last thing, if you want to drive those naturally, you need to have enough velocity either to give initial velocity of some sort or to have enough speed of motion. Let's say if you splash it out with an object, you have to, to have enough speed uh, for it naturally to catch up and scatter into tendrils. So these are um, good examples for it, as you can see. And uh, always think about attractive motion. Um, so. Um, I'm here not only to talk how to, how I went to Houdini, but also to inspire you to do something different, uh, with any simulation that you do. Find ways to, to do it simpler. Uh, so with fewer nodes, um, with fewer forces, let's say, or inverted gravity, or like you see these examples, you have uh, a droplet just, uh, drop just bouncing instead of going into the, uh, the water itself, or, or those ribbon-like, um, looks that I was actually asked from, from the client to do. Um, so, and a little bit note about look development because that does play a big part. Um, so, for example, you could 
you could save time and uh, make make it look very realistic. Uh, for example, these mixing up fluids, it is basically the main body of fluid that has good UVs and you just have displacement on it and uh, work through uh, sort of faking that it's mixing up uh, the fluid and it works very well. Um, so save time, whatever you can. And the uh, subsurface scattering is something that definitely works the best um, with sort of transparent fluids like uh, at the top right corner. Um, but you could go without it if you have like more paint-like fluid, you could use plastic sometimes to save a lot of time. Uh, so at the end of the day, I encourage you to maximize efficiency um, because you want to learn more, you want to create more and do more things inside Houdini. So, and projects are usually, especially if you work with commercial industry, are very um, tight deadlines over there. Um, so it's always best to have more time for creativity. So for that, I would encourage you to minimize particle count. So as I said before, for tests, but also for the final result, whenever you can. So as you can see uh, in the bottom left image below, there's tiny difference between the wireframe and the object itself, right? But for, sim for simulation, it does play a big role because when you go really high resolution, um, any bit of uh, container, let's say, or uh, fluid that you can save uh, means hours of save time and also better simulation um, calculations itself. And also, not always you need to, for example, when you're asked for a splash shot, right? Um, not always you need to do the whole splash from the beginning, like with the pouring and controlling the tendrils and all of that. Sometimes, like this example, uh, you can use the just container of uh, fluid that you control velocities and drive those uh, that force uh, together to mimic the, the splash and eventually you have the shot from the already splashed um, uh, object and it just continues on. And um, that's really efficient to do and have a lot of control. Substeps, as I said before, really make sure I, I cannot emphasize it enough. It's really important to work through the substeps. And uh, sometimes, and most of the times, I, I always uh, try the, my best to find a way to use forces instead of objects. Because whenever you have a um, object and particle interaction, there's more cal calculations for any software, right? And, um, and no, no matter how great of, uh, of a beast of your machine you have, um, you, you could save some time, right? So, so use forces whenever you can, whether it's like driving it, uh, like swirly motion or anything. Um, and um, that also gives additionally more dynamic results and more beautiful, um, more beautiful results. Uh, bugs into design, <laughs> a little note that I had, um, while Houdini will not have bugs, your setup might be because you might have like some mistake or anything. And uh, I, I found more often than not talking with other Houdini artists that uh, they made some mistake and it was even more beautiful. Uh, so use that to into design. And that's composing simulation that I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, never... Uh, Never use, uh, whenever you need to do a lot of uh, like com complex look, let's say, uh, never use one scene for everything, for example. Use different simulations, split it into as many simulations as you can. And um, so, for example, this Dessart uh, commercial that I, I was asked to do, there are three simulations, three ribbons, and all of them are separate. And it's not only that you would save time in simulation, but also you will have more control later on because you could uh, speed up differently uh, those meshes and use it, uh, rotate it, scale it, and use it in the exact way that you want or your team wants to use it because it depends uh, how you work. So Houdini, how and why? Uh, like I, I told you before, I'm new to Houdini. I've been using Houdini for a couple of years for basically uh, just using all the files, transferring, look development, and dabbed a little bit in and out of Houdini with the you know tutorials and uh, started like thinking what I'm excited about. Uh, so I decided that I'm gonna and uh, in and you know not take all of it all together because I think honestly that you could be inspired by Houdini and learn Houdini for more than one lifetime. Uh, that's my honest opinion. And uh, so I'd rather take one mountain out, of, out after the other. So I did some vellum simulations uh, that I needed for some projects, then um, actually uh, 
first I did some simulations, did some, um, some of the videos that aren't working, but it's fine. You can see it on in Instagram. Um, I did some Antagma tutorials and stuff. And eventually some of it, um, went into, uh, into the actual projects. Um, so, so that, that's always like that. You, you focus on one area, you dig deeper into that, do a lot of tests, create some works, put it on, online, and there's new, um, projects coming up that you can actually use it for. And, um, so I really encourage you to take the leap if you're new to Houdini or, or you, you hesitant to use Flip, for example, take that leap. Houdini is a mountain made of a lot of little hills. So you don't have to think of, uh, of it as a huge, huge, big, big thing that you will never master. <laughs> um, just think of it as a, an, an amazing tool that you can have confidence at because that's, that's why I had in the very beginning. I knew that whatever files I will give, it will too. <laughs> whatever I need, I will figure out. And there's always a community that we can work with together. You're never alone. And, uh, so it's, you know, I'm uh, a, motorbiker myself. I, I love uh, riding my KTM. And when I'm in front of the hill, it's super scary because it seems like it's so tall. So it's the same with Houdini. But unless you put the full gas in the beginning, um, you will not climb it that well or not be satisfied about the climb. But once you put the full gas and focus on one area, let's say in Houdini, uh, for, for a week, for a month, uh, just focus on that and double down on it earlier. Invest earlier, both in your time and workshops and tutorials. Uh, there's a bunch of free ones as well. That's what I did. And once you do that, you you realize that you're in the middle of the hill, and then you're at the top. And and that was quite easy and fun. Way way more fun than you thought it would be. And you can climb another one and another one. So double down earlier, learn earlier, invest earlier, and just don't be so casual about it because it's very easy when, especially if you're working with some other software, when you're very, very good at it, uh, and you could be, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and us and you could know all the answers. It's very hard to move into new software, um, at least for me and some others that I talk to, um, where you know that you're a you're newcomer. Um, you don't know all the things. But once you double down on it, uh, once you learn, like I did, for example, flip, uh, I will move next to, or I did some vellum, I will move next to my, my fo next focus area and uh, make sure that I'm putting myself into the corner to find the best ways to do things. And there's always like lots and lots of resources and community is extremely supportive. That's one of the best things of uh, Houdini. And also it's always the, there's a, always the confidence that Software itself is completely uh, renewed, like uh, new things all the time, and um, and that's that's really really exciting um, every year. And we know that there's a lot of support uh, with the community. You can have uh, like go to a Facebook group or to Particle CG community that I have on Discord. There's a bunch of people there as well. And if you have what you need to know, is you need to know what you need. And once you know what you need, you could discuss with all of us together and we can figure out any problem that you have. And uh, so obviously, Antagma, everyone knows it <laughs> probably. Uh, I love, uh, I've been doing a lot of their Patreon just uh, out of fun in the beginning. Paul is Steve's Patreon, I really, really enjoy. Uh, Jackton Okore is uh, my former student from, from Realpo and he took the, the mindset and put into Houdini actually even earlier than me. And I'm very proud of him. And we were discussing a lot about um, how to transfer our our best ideas into Houdini successfully. So, and there's Lane Morty Design uh, platform that I have created separately from my work, where I would put uh, more and more in the future uh, workshops and free tutorials and anything that I would come up with in the future. So there's a little bit of velocity sculpting that um, I just want to mention. So there's those yellow lines, obviously, those are velocities. Uh, and I used it links velocity plugin, free plugin for that, that I found in, in some forum, I think, in side effects itself, because that was a, what I was searching for, how to control velocities. And for that, as you can see, that's in, in the example, that moon um, with velocities and the, the bottom, bottom image um, video is, um, simply velocity sculpting. It's it's uh, 
nothing is a rocket science, but you have to actually double down on it, as I said, and just to do a lot of tests and find the best ways. And actually, I found the, found the best setup for this specific thing. Uh, I put it on a workshop, I explained it. Um, you have a 50% discount if you want to this week. Uh, but other than that, follow me on Instagram and uh, I will update with more and more, more things. Thank you very much. And uh, I, but if, I leave, if I leave you with anything, I want to leave you with this. Complexity is not our pride, but great and efficient design is. Always focus on the things that you want to go for the next step. Don't be scared about, don't be scared about Houdini. Go earlier into it, um, because that's the only regret that you might have in the future. And uh, keep, keep the mindset of learning, keep the mindset of focus, and the mindset of fluid simulation itself. What matters? Scale, uh, tendrils, detail, self-extension. Work that through, and you will be good to go. I promise you that. And then a little drop of mindset becomes a glorious splash. Thank you. Any questions? Questions? Don't be shy. Well, if not, oh, George. What is it about uh, splashes and liquids and water that really caught your interest? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, back, back in the day, like it was three, 13 years ago or something, when I found out about 3D itself, I looked through all the things that you could do with 3D. And, um, and I loved the challenge. I really loved the challenge, especially back in the day, it was super challenging to do uh, photorealistic uh, splashes or fluid simulations and uh, and it I love the challenge I think that's one of my nature to do and I really really enjoy watching uh, I, I'm a photo former photographer as well, as well I loved macro photo shooting and fluids before that so I thought that's amazing that I could finally figure out how to do it and then make it different from real life so it looks like real life but it has like either different gravity or a different shape that you now can sculpt inside Houdini. Um, there's just infinite possibilities and I love the, the look of it in general. I'm just having a lot of satisfaction in, in, in production over, overall. Of course, it's challenging all the time, um, but in the final result too. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. Any other questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, okay. I have a question because uh, flip is not my thing, but I'm really curious. Uh, you touched on the point of choosing random particles, then like advecting them as bubbles through the, yes. through the liquid. Uh, do you have any tips how to make sure that those points that you selected are always inside of this volume? Because I'm guessing you don't want the ones who are like going to the surface because they are not bubbles anymore. Any tips there? Yes, uh, usually it does stay with the group expression that I did. As, as much as I tested out, it does stay inside. Uh, other than that, I would think of deleting like outside the mesh um, with delete node or something like that. But it, it didn't. I didn't have a problem with group expression. The only node that I do have with group expression use ID um, to to export it. Uh, so in simulation, you have to check the ID so uh, particles will have their IDs. Otherwise, it will not have uh, the same uh, particles selected throughout this, uh, the whole sequence. That's something that's really good that you reminded me of that I forgot to tell. Thank you. And I will update you if there's any issue. <laughs> <laughs> good. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you very much, great, too. Great presentation.